now we'll talk a little bit about our olfactory system. And as you can see, you do have the handout, so feel free to take notes on that. When you breathe oil molecules, they're received by the brain's olfactory center via the nostrils. This activates a central part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala manages your memories and, and manages your emotions. And it's the only way that the amygdala responds. So spoken word or written word, it's not going to affect your amygdala. The only thing that's going to affect that is aroma. So if we can have a volunteer who wants to read what the amygdala is. Anyone want to read out loud? Where's it at? In the yellow highlight. Oh, there it is. <laughs> the amygdala is the integrated center for emotions and emotional behavior and motivation. The stimulation of the amygdala causes intense emotions. So our nose is the outer extension of the brain, and inhaling is the fastest way to get to the emotional center of our brain. And then that way it will then quickly affect our mood. I need a new battery. The limbic system. Essential oils communicate to the limbic system to recall or release stored emotions and memories. It can even recall memories that have been stored up with us since childhood. As we get deeper into the body, now we've gone beyond that sense of smell and now we're into the brain. When it starts to trigger memories, now we know that we've gotten into the limbic system. Our emotional response is what we're going to get at, be after. <clears throat> our emotions, our memories, our hormones. Our moods are a complex interplay of emotional and physical components. Emotions are often the root cause of many physical illnesses. <coughs> so as we know, when we keep in and harbor in our moods and our emotions and we're not able to work through them through prayer or through exercise or through eating healthy because that all weighs on our bodies then it's going to start manifesting physically we're going to start having some physical ail um, illnesses when we're not processing some of our emotions um, like we need to and i'm not saying that everything that we have is through emotions i'm not that every sickness or illness that we have, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but it can manifest if we think about it. So if we worry a lot, you know, our stomachs are going to start, you know, the acids in the stomach and it's going to start causing that. So that's what I'm trying to get at. All right. Mood continuum. Lack of peace, passionless are emotions. Stress and fatigue are physical. So we're going to be looking at how we can use essential oils when we're feeling certain ways. And we've, we've, uh, the company and science has created these quadrants to help us identify what oils that we should use for our emotional needs. So if I'm feeling fatigued and I have no peace, as you can see in that, we might be needing an oil. Oh. called serenity. So we're looking at the quadrant of the fatigued and no peace in that upper left corner. See that? So we're recognizing that we're needing something calming and serenity is that blend that will um, help us in our calming. Kim, can I have you um, cast these? Just take them and pass around. You want to open them? <laughs> I'm going to be, Kim will be our oil monitor today as we go through these. So everyone just feel free to sniff around and smell. Now serenity is a calming blend and that is it has lavender flower, cedar wood, coal wood leaf, lang lang, marjoram, roman chamomile, vetiver, vanilla bean absolute. It's very very calming when we have and no peace, that would be a good one to diffuse. It helps promote sleep as well and helps lessen our tension. Now, if we are fatigued and have no passion, we may need to be using oils that have invigorating or stimulating or motivating 
properties in them, which Citrus Bliss would be our next one that we'll pass around. And Citrus Bliss is, I mean, how could you not with, you know, when you smell citrus, anything citrusy, how could you not feel invigorating and have energy? And this blend has wild orange, lemon, grapefruit, mandarin, bergamot, tangerine, and clementine, and a little vanilla to add some sweetness to it. So it's packed with citrus oils in there to really help invigorate and stimulate and motivate people feeling fatigue and have passion. That was going around next. Love this one. All right, the next oil, when we're feeling stressed and have no passion, this really great oil that's next is Elevation. It's the joyful blend. It has sandalwood, citrus, lavadin, tangerine, elemi, lemon myrtle, melissa, ylang ylang, and osmanthus. This one is very, very stimulating as well. It has some citrus, God bless you. Sorry. <laughs> Took too much of a Yeah. <laughs> that way up there. Now you're elevated. It's very cheerful. It helps with inspiring, encouraging, and, and cheerfulness. It really is the bergamot in there is really good too. It helps promote that positive mood. The next oil is our grounding blend. It's uh, when we have no peace and we're stressed in that lower left corner. Balance is our grounding blend. It helps us become more stable, grounding, reassuring. It's very consoling. It um, has a lot of the woodsy sense to it. It has spruce leaf, hogwood leaf, frankincense, blue tansy. It's very calming and well-being. It, it, it's really great. My son uses it in his beard oil, so he's constantly smelling it. So he always feels really grounded when he uses that. It does help with stress as well. Balance is a great oil. Now we're going to go in. These are the new oils that just came out in September. We have Neroli. Neroli is very good for relaxing and calming. Um, we have, you can apply these to the pulse points throughout the day to uplift your mood. You can rub it on your wrist, ear, all those kinds of things. It has, um, you can combine neroli, lavender, and ylang-ylang and marjoram for a relaxing and aromatic massage experience. Do you want to do that? Neroli in itself is its own oil. Jasmine, love jasmine. Apply to the bottoms of the feet and pulse points in the morning to uplift the mood. It's also a fragrance, a really nice fragrance. And then last but not least, rose. Really does help with uplifting the mood as well. So these are mood lifters that um, just came out in September as a, a permanent product that Sotera has. We're going to talk now about our emotional aromatherapy system. Now, the system comes in two forms. It comes in an actual five milliliter bottle that you can put in a diffuser, or it comes in a roller bottle where you could just simply, it's for convenience, it's already diluted with fractionated coconut oil. You can apply that like a perfume. And it's really, really nice that you can apply it with a roller uh, throughout the day. It contains six blends that have been carefully formulated to provide targeted emotional health benefits. Now when we're on our wheel, now on the, I think it's third page already, right? Mm -hmm. You're, we're going to see how we can use our oils. I don't know if you can actually see what blends are there, but if you can see here, if you have a um, a feeling of being discouraged, gloomy, distressed, somber, disinterested, if you're in um, anxious or insecure or apathetic, if you're feeling this, then this would be the oil that you would want to use. It could go to either, either way. They kind of cross over each other. So this one we're going to talk about next is motivate. 
to motivate, promotes feelings of confidence, courage, and belief. It counteracts negative emotions of doubt, pessimism, and cynicism. And it has peppermint plant, clementine, coriander, basil, yuzu peel, melissa leaf, rosemary leaf, and vanilla bean absolute. So if you're feeling any of these, my mom is an artist, and when she, after my father passed away, she was really having a hard time getting motivated to paint again. And so I sent her some Motivate and another oil, and it really did open up her creativity again and allowed her, as she was working through it, just, just the aroma just helped her be more energetic and passion, more passionate about her, about her art work. So this is Motivate. Next we'll talk about Cheer. Cheer is the uplifting blend. As you can see, it has citrus and that, uh, those pretty little stars, it's star anise, and that is an amazing scent, um, mixing the two together. Cheer. Um, let's see what it has in it promotes feeling of optimism, cheerfulness, and happiness, and it counteracts negative emotions and feeling down, blue, or low. It has wild orange peel, clove bud, star anise root, seed, lemon myrtle, nutmeg, vanilla, bean extract, ginger, cinnamon bark, and zwarf, Z-D-R-A-B-E-T-Z, or whoever can say it, you get an extra ticket. <laughs> So as we can see, the cheer is on our chart when we're looking at it. It's more in the um, the seed. Of, what would be that one? It would be in the spices and the citrus. Mixing those together is the cheer. Next is passion. I gave my mom some passion as well um, to help her with that having that passion to paint again and to help uplift her mood so she can get excited about it. And I might add, she just entered her, uh, one of her paintings that she was working with, she just kept going over it again because it just wasn't working for her. And finally she came home from church one day and she just changed her clothes, put on her painting spot and just did this painting. She ended up winning People's Choice at the art show um, two weeks ago. And I'm so proud of her. Um, because she's breaking through. It's been a long haul after my dad passed away, and so she's breaking through. She does beautiful work. Anyway, so passion <laughs> ignites feelings of excitement, passion, and joy. They counteract negative feelings of boredom and disinterest. It has fractionated coconut oil, cardamom seed, cinnamon bark, ginger, clove, sandalwood, jasmine. So we've got a little flower, and we have a little spice in there. Are we, do we not? Kind of, sort of? Herbs. Are they the herbs? Grasses and spices. Grasses and spices. Okay, so the spices are probably the cinnamon, the cardamom, the clove, and I wonder if the, I don't know what the grasses would be. Maybe the jasmine. Oh, damiana leaf is probably the grass. Uh, next would be forgive. Forgive promotes feelings of contentment, relief, and patience. It counteracts negative emotions of anger and guilt. And it has the spruce leaf, bergamot peel, juniper berry fruit, myrrh, resin, arborvitae wood, nutka tree wood, thyme leaf, and citronella herb. Forgive is a, is a really nice one too. And so what we do is we're, when we're diffusing these oils, if we're really trying to work through something, these oils, we don't just drop them on and they're not magic potions. We, it's when we're working through things, when we're working through spiritual um, some issues that we have to that we're dealing with spiritually and we're you know, praying through it and then using the oils to help open up that part of the brain because we are um, we are wonderfully made we are really wonderfully made and when we look at our olfactory system like you talked about at the very beginning to see that the only way that you can get into those memories is through the set that through sense that just that says so much the only other way is if they saw a hole in my head and Rip me open and try to get in there. Who knows what they find? In there. <laughs> a lot of oils. A lot of oils, right? I know. <laughs> an oily brain. Uh, the next is console, and that is the one that I'm diffusing right now. I love console. I love it. Promotes feelings of comfort and hope. 
counteracts negative emotions of grief, sadness, and hopelessness. And it has the frankincense and patchouli and lang and lang and uh, amorous bark, sandalwood, rose, and osteanthus. Really, really nice combination. And then we have peace, which is promotes feelings of peace, reassurance, and contentment. That's another one of my favorites. They counteract anx anxious and fearful emotions. And it has the vetiver, lavender, ylang ylang, frankincense again, clary sage, marjoram, and some spearmint herb. And peace is a really, really great one. Two. Now, like I said, these are in the emotions kit, the emo emotional aromatherapy kit, and um, it, and you can so you can purchase them individually in uh, five milliliter bottles or in a roller. Oh, are the five mil? Um, you can get them individually. Yeah, yeah, you can. That's right. And so the rollers, you can too. That's right. They used to just be in the kits, and then they have a mail. Hope. Did I give you hope? Yeah. Uh, give us no hope. I, you know, <laughs> I will give you hope. <laughs> I don't think I have it there. That's for uh, I don't have it. I didn't bring it. I'm sorry. Hope is really, it's a really nice oil as well. It has bergamot, elangolin, frankincense, and vanilla bean. The great thing about hope oil is that with each purchase, as it says here on the screen, of the hope oil touch, the full price, the $20, goes donated to the Healing Hands Foundation, and it supports that OUR operation underground, and um, which is, you know, to help with uh, getting those uh, people who, to end child slavery and sex trafficking. It's a pretty unique operation. You can Google it and find out a little bit more about that. Underground rescue. So in conclusion, on my part, I'm concluding right now. It's important to be aware of how our body is reacting to our feelings and to understand which oil will help us to feel safe. So I really hope that this short little intro to oil, just to see how they work on the chemical level and how, how our brain works. Um, Will be helpful and if you're in, if anyone is interested in learning a little bit more about them just get with me afterwards or the person that enrolled you or is supporting you and i'm sure that we can get some more resources for you so i want to introduce now my friend shireen gentry shireen and i met a couple of years ago at the uptown stroll and high point she was um actually you were the head of a signing at um, the table and she's an author and a counselor and i'm just going to go ahead and read the bio Woman. Shireen grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia, has lived in High Point since 1988 when her husband Joel began his private practice in dentistry. So if anyone needs a dentist <laughs> in High Point, Joel Gentry, DBS. She attended Meredith College and graduated from Wake Forest University, that's even deeper, with a degree in psychology and a minor in music performance. She holds a master's degree in professional counseling and completed studies at the National Center for Paralegal Training. She's currently practicing as a certified life coach in the areas of marriage, relationships, stress management, health and wellness. And Shireen and her husband, Joel, have two children, Austin 26 and Forrest 23. And her passions include family time, reading, and integrating her educational background with life applications to encourage others through speaking and writing. So Shireen, thank you. <laughs> And she sings in the choir with me. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Alto soprano. Um, do I need that? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see. Where do I need that now? You can point it back. There we go. Okay. I love meeting new people. So I'm not a native high pointer, but you know, I just feel like my life is enriched when I get to meet new people, and so I feel like I've got a room full of new friends tonight. So I hope you'll come introduce yourself to me. I'd love to just to stay in touch, just because we're women and we're all on a life journey together, right? So um, anyway, it's a privilege for me to be here tonight, and one of my passions is to encourage other women, and 
Um, and I do that in a variety of ways, but my, my main passion is, is doing this right here. I used to work at the hospital up on uh, the psychiatric unit, just PRN after I got my degree. But I discovered one thing about myself at that time was I love doing groups. And I love doing groups because I love to give people information and give people tools for, for life. Okay, um, and so at any rate, I feel like no matter what experience is behind you or how old you are, it really doesn't matter. What really matters is what you do from this moment forward. But tonight, I'm here to actually just um, give you some tips and tools. Is anybody grieving tonight? Has anyone lost someone recently? Okay, someone on, I'm not, but someone on my team's uh, son died Sunday. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, if you've lost someone, um, maybe not recently, but if you've lost someone in the past, maybe some of these concepts will be familiar to you. Um, maybe they'll be new, or maybe you just want to take some notes and you know someone who is grieving, and hopefully you can encourage them tonight. And that's that's my goal as a life coach, is just to equip you to not only um, give you some hope, but also to perhaps give some hope to others as well. Okay, um, I love Hebrews 11.1. 1. I was told it was okay to, to come from a, a spiritual um, framework tonight, so just understand that I'll be doing that. <laughs> I've been given the green light for that. Um, and what does Hebrews 1 tell us? Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Okay? Friends, this is the hope that is undergirding and hopefully foundational to our lives that transcends our life circumstances. Because you know what? We're going to have, if you live long enough, things are just going to happen. We live in an imperfect world. Um, bad things happen. You know, um, sometimes it's not a, even a result of our own doing. It's just called life on this planet, okay? But, but we are told in Scripture that the hope that we're to cling to is not dependent on circumstances always turning out the way that we would like for them to, all right? Ask Job, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Everybody's got a story, and I want to just start with mine. These are my parents. Um, I am actually an adopted orphan from Iran, and my dad, um, my mom and dad were married, well, they met in January of 1960, they got married, uh, December of 1960, they got married in January of 61, so they dated for a month. Um, <laughs> this picture was taken as they were newlyweds living in St. Louis, and this is where they lived until my dad got a military assignment, which took him to Tehran, where he was the uh, commanding officer of the 64th Engineering Battalion. It was a pretty big wig over in Tehran during the reign of the last Shah. Uh, but but these are this is probably my favorite picture of my parents. But why do I even bring this up? Um, when they adopted me, they were older in life by standards 55 years ago. Okay, not by standards today, but back then, you know, mom was in her late 30s, dad was already in his 40s. So you fast forward that, I was caregiving in my 30s. My youngest son was still in diapers when I started caregiving my parents. Nobody could relate to what I was going through. And so at, they each had physical concerns, they had each dementia, but it manifested itself differently. I was each of their powers of attorney, but I had to take care of their, their issues without the other one knowing. Okay, it was just not a fun time for me. And then I lost them both in 2001, eight weeks apart on each side of 9-11, okay? So I did not know what grief looked like. I had not gone to school and gotten my counseling degree to understand the mind, the emotions, how we think. I can just remember being in that time period after 9-11, y'all probably remember it well, some of you, thinking, okay, our world is now in a, a, an odd kind of bubble. Well, I'm in my own bubble, okay? So I faced the holiday season not even knowing what to expect. Um, and, you know, I actually remember that quite well, honestly. I was just trying to survive from day to day. But this is, this is how my story started with my mom and dad. Now, 
science has told us that we are there is a mind-body connection. Um, if any, uh, are you a nurse? Did I hear you say you're a nurse? Okay, are you familiar with the DSM at all? The Diagnostic for Statistical Manual, which does diagnosis for mental health? Okay. It's not my area. It's not your area, okay. Even the DSM, which is what clinicians use for um, diagnosing um, mental health disorders, in the forward, now I haven't seen the current one, but in the DSM-4, before you even start, it already gives a, a preface indicating the mind-body connection. So science is already saying, hey, we're, we're a complicated person. Okay, there is a mind-body connection. But that really shouldn't, oop, let's go back. That really shouldn't surprise us because what does scripture say? Five times scripture tells us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your body. In some verses it says strength. Five times in scripture we are already told about the mind-body connection. Okay? So again, against the backdrop of scripture, sometimes science tells us things that God already has. All right? Um, and so we are told in scripture that we are... Yeah, you know, we, we have um, many parts to who we are to make the whole, okay? Now, whether you've lost someone or not, grief is a kind of stress, okay? Now, there's all different kinds of stress. There's actually good stress, which is called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. -E -S -S. There's um, distress, which is not good, but stress is... Um, Stress can be different. So if I were to ask someone, there's no right or wrong answer here, what stresses you? What would your answer be? My younger sister. Your younger <laughs> sister stresses you, okay. What else stresses you? Your job, okay. Stress is unique for each person. So what stresses me may not stress you at all, okay. So stress is very individualistic unless it really is something like a major life stressor. Okay, but again, what I'm going to talk about now is the holistic care because just as I've told you that, you know, God has created our beings, um, we are one person, but we're made up of many different parts. Guess what? You can take care of each of those parts, and I'm going to tell you how to do that. Okay, um, if you are in what I call chronic stress, Okay, so right now my father-in-law is under chronic stress. He's been caregiver to my mother-in-law for about five years now, 24-7. Uh, chronic stress. Now, not acute stress, but chronic. The kind that just won't let up. It just keeps going. You don't know when it's going to end, that kind of thing. The key for stress management is you've got to have daily recovery. You've got to have daily recovery. And if people say, well, I don't have time for daily recovery, well, you've got to make time for daily recovery. So uh, we're going to talk about how you break down the different parts of who you are and how you target each of those parts for wellness in your life. So this, this very strange word you will not find in a dictionary, but it's actually part of the counseling paradigm now. Um, it's called biopsychosocio-spiritual. All right, well, hello, here we go again. Science is saying what scripture has already told us, the bios means that the body, we are a physical being, okay? The psycho part means the mind. We've got a mind and a brain. The socio part means the people in our lives, okay? We are created for relationships. If you think about it, God in his trinity, three persons in one, he created himself, in relationship, all right? Um, and then spiritual, the faith journey part is very, very important. Some people may say, well, you know what? I don't worship anything. And so, you know, when I would work at the hospital, you know, I was told, you know, you can't talk about faith unless the patients bring it up. So whenever someone would say, oh, well, I don't believe in any of that, I'll say, well, you worship something. You know, something has your attention. Something has been put on a pedestal that maybe got you here. Something is, is getting too much of your attention, and it means more in your life than it really should. Okay, so I'm going to give a few pointers for what are some things that we can do just for our physical being. 
which actually help our mental health too. But um, first, I'm going to talk about sleep. Now, these are just some life coaching tools. I actually team up with my husband. He treats um, sleep apnea patients and makes special customized devices for them for snoring and sleep apnea. So I sit down with them and go over cognitive techniques to improve sleep, okay? I'm gonna give you two tools to either use for yourself or to pass along to friends. Neuroscience says that both of these work. The first one is called a worry journal. Okay, so what you do is you keep a, a hard copy paper pen by the side of your bed. If you've got concerns, if you've got worries, then you know what you do? You take that paper and pen and before you go to sleep, you write those things out. Don't type them on your phone. All right, we don't want blue light before trying to go to sleep, okay? The, another tip there is no blue light an hour and a half before going to bed. Why? Because blue light interferes with the brain's production of melatonin. You need melatonin to go to sleep. You don't want to interfere with that, okay? So, yes. How, I'm sorry, how far in advance? Um, an hour and a half. But is blue light on a phone or an iPad? All of it. Oh, oh man, I like my iPad. Now, you can put apps on your devices that changes out the blue light for another light. Mm. So, you can do that. I don't have a, a, it's not a problem area for me, it is for my husband, but he has swapped out the blue light for, I think there's yellow light, there's pink light. I think you can Google and get apps so the blue light is gone, but you can replace it with something else that will not interfere with the melatonin production in your brain. Mm -hmm. uh, the iPhone has a, like a moon in the settings you can click. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to turn it off in general because it doesn't do me any good even if that's what you want. It can change like the shading on it. Um, not shady, but like the light. Yes, exactly. Interesting. Filter. Yeah, I very, thought that was do not disturb. It's a different. Okay. Okay. So um, a worry journal. Okay. And the, the benefit of this, okay, now with the season approaching and everybody's busy and everybody's stressed out, you know what? Just write out the things that are on your mind because Writing it out actually helps cleanse the brain of whatever it's thinking about. Mm -hmm. And so if you're having a hard time going to sleep, that worry journal can help you cleanse the mind as, <coughs> as the brain, because what you're trying to do is to slow down your brain's activity and to cleanse it of the things that are on the brain so it doesn't stay awake and kind of wired, okay? Visualization is a technique I use all the time for myself, okay? But it really works. So if you wake up in the middle of the night, well, what's the first thing that happens? You start thinking about stuff, right? Because guess what? The brain does not shut off. The brain is always active. And so visualization is the cognitive technique because what you're trying to do is replace one brain activity with another brain activity. So the brain is naturally going to think about what it thinks about. So visualization would be, if I were to say, okay, um, Laura, put me, put yourself in your happy place. Where would you be and what would you be doing? Fly fishing. Okay, okay, very good. Doing the words. Fly fishing. Fly fishing. Fly fishing. Okay. So it's a visual image of you standing someplace and, and fly fishing, okay? That is visualization. So each of you can pick your own uh, place, happy place, to where, for me, it's in a lounge chair on the dock feeling the sun in my face, okay? That's my happy space. And so when I wake up in the middle of the night and I start thinking about things, I say, brain, no, you're not going to do that. I'm going to go to my happy place. And what you're doing is you're replacing one brain activity with another because, again, the goal is to shut the brain down so it can go back to sleep and not stay awake. I've had clients tell me, Oh, Shireen, well, when I get, you know, when I wake up in the middle of the night, I pray. And so my response is always, hey, I'm not going to be that person and tell you not to pray. That mm -hmm. sounds awful. <laughs> I said, but you say amen, and then you go to your happy place. Because as long as you keep praying, you're keeping your brain active, you're staying awake, and the goal is to shut down the brain so you can get the much-needed sleep you need. Okay. Um, stress and food. Okay. Yeah. All right. That looks good. Yeah. Stress and food. Why is it important? We always hear that we need protein and vegetables, but why? 
Um, with the holidays coming, you know, it's, it's quick to go through the drive through get something high in the wrong kind of fat or the carbs, grab a bagel, grab the chips, grab, you know, the, the sweets, especially if you're stressed or, or whatnot. If you're an emotional leader, you know whether you are or not. I'm not going to ask for volunteers for that. But, but let me tell you what happens in the brain when you don't eat well, okay? Um, when people are depressed or blue, and again, I'm going to use a word that Laura just mentioned, a continuum. Depression is on a continuum. Okay, so if I were to draw a continuum up here and on this end, I would say blue day, you know, you wake up and maybe it's rainy outside and you're thinking, oh, really? You know, it's sort of a blue day. The other end of the continuum is going to be clinical depression, okay, where major depressive disorder is, you know, maybe someone has gone and gotten um, diagnosed with major depressive disorder, okay, and then they meet the criteria for clinical depression. But feeling blue, depression can fall on that continuum anywhere. And what's happening in the brain is a, a dip in the serotonin levels, okay? So here's one thing that diet does for you. When you eat lean protein and vegetables, it actually increases your serotonin levels, which fights against depression and anxiety. So we always hear, oh, we need to eat right, sure. Okay, we know we need to eat right. But sometimes we haven't been told why we need to eat right. And that's one of the whys, okay? Now, oops. All right. Another thing, exercise. Well, we know about this too, right? Okay. Um, when we exercise, and look, some people think, oh, you know, I've got to go to a gym. I don't have time for a gym membership. Okay, you know what? I'm talking like a 15-minute walk. Okay, especially if you're in a chronic season of stress and, um, you know, you, you've got to carve out just a little chunk of time for your body to move. Um, because not only will exercise keep your serotonin levels up, in fact, in some clinical trials, exercise was just as effective as an antidepressant. So if anybody's on here, in here, taking an antidepressant, don't go home and stop taking your antidepressant. Okay, don't do that. I'm not an MD. I would never encourage anybody to do that. I'm simply saying we don't know the benefits that exercise, um, what it does to our brain chemistry when we do it. All right, so it actually increases our serotonin levels. Here's another thing that happens when we're stressed out. Our body, in times of non-stress produces cortisol. That's okay. But when we're stressed, cortisol is on overload in our body. Okay, and that is a bad, bad thing. Um, exercise helps control that cortisol. Let me tell you too, one of the best things you can do for um, uh, when you're stressed out is to drink water because it helps get rid of some of that cortisol in your body that's floating around. And again, exercise, drinking water helps with that. Okay, um, if you're in a season of grief and or if you know someone who is in a season of grief, we call this the tangled ball of emotions. Mm -hmm. And so in any given day, a person is gonna have all kinds of emotions, all kinds of emotions. It's gonna kind of catch them off guard. Um, there may be disappointment, there may be despair, there may be denial. You know, there are five stages of grief when someone is hurting or experience loss of some kind. Um, there's anger. Um, and usually anger is what we call an M&M &M emotion, like the candy M&M, &M, because usually anger is the outer coating for another emotion or emotions that's happening underneath the anger. Okay, so anger is usually just the, the outside emotion that you see. But if someone is grieving, um, please tell them, you know, you're not going crazy. You know, you're going to experience a number of emotions in a given day um, because of your grief and loss. Okay, when we go through crisis, um, it will challenge your core beliefs like nothing else will. Okay. And um, it's very important that we pay attention to what we call self-talk. Has anybody ever heard of self-talk? Okay, 
Have just self affirmation. Self-talk, okay. Yes. Self talks what we do in our brain. Yes. Um, we're, 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 we're developing that belief. Yes. We can change it. Yes, we can we're, change it. We're grieving or depressed. Yes. Okay. Self talk is an <clears throat> internal dialogue that you have with yourself that nobody else hears. Or maybe you verbalize it out loud. But Okay, you all know catch what I'm saying? We all have this inner dialogue with ourselves about either ourselves, about life, about um, you know, things that happen to us, um, or we may have ex certain experiences, and so we have certain takeaways of, from that life experience. That becomes a self-talk dialogue that we've got to be very careful about because either the things that we tell ourselves are grounded in truth or they're grounded in lies. And you talk about, you know, having lack of peace. Um, you know, a lot of times it may be a self-talk issue as well um, because there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between what we think is supposed to happen, what really is happening, and we haven't really connected the dots. Well, the self-talk is what happens that, um, needs to be paid attention to because what we tell ourselves is either going to be uh, something that benefits us emotionally or something that does not benefit us emotionally. Kind of a difficult topic. Do have I explained it well enough for you? Okay. Can I share something? Else? Sure, sure. I, I met with a pastor the other day about something and he said that men and women are different in two, in two ways that men deal with um, they get in trouble, in other words, with the flesh of their eyes. Yes. And women get in trouble with their self-talk. Oh, yes. That doesn't surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not just kind of not skinny enough. I have don't have this talent or that talent. What men are like, I don't care. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right. So, you're, you're touching on the self-talk mm -hmm. dialogue that we all have. You know, and it doesn't, it can take anything to, to trigger it. The, you know, it can be uh, social media. You know, my goodness. I mean, it can be the people that don't show up for your class. Oh, oh yeah. I can't do this. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, so you've got, you've got to be careful. You've got to think about what you think about. And if it's not grounded in truth, then your emotions, which are negative, are going to follow that belief, that self-talk that belief that precedes it, okay? This is huge though with teenagers right now. Yes. We listened to a lecture on something last night about with a pediatrician, psychiatrist talking about the escalation in, in suicide uh, because of that very thing. Yes, and um, Rogan Kirsch, yes. Okay, Rogan Kirsch, who's now the uh, provost over at Lake Forest, I've heard him several times speak, and he's an expert. He's a social psychologist, but he's mm -hmm. also an expert on millennials. He says the millennial generation is the most anxious and depressed generation that we've ever had. Okay, and part of it is, I mean, you know, it, they, they're, it's coming from all, from all angles. Okay, it's coming from the hovering parents. It's coming from social media because they feel like they can't measure up. I mean, there are, but they get that, you know, what do they internalize? You know, if they make a B on a test, what are they telling themselves about, the, well, I'm not good enough? You know, um, I, I'm never going to make it if I don't get an A. Or I'm a failure if I don't make it into the, you know, the best college. Okay, these are self-talk mm -hmm. things that need to be paid attention to and challenged, okay? Would you say to you, I know, um, we went through a course at work, <clears throat> Sorry, I've been sick and, and actually better, but um, a lot with like mindfulness, this two brain thing yes. where you have all that chatter and then you have your other brain that can look more rationally and say, that's just your emotion. And they, one thing I've been implementing um, has to do with driving, uh, you know, to make cut you off. I'm, I yell a lot in my car at people, like a lot of um, but so now I just kind of stop and say, and observe and say, oh, that made me feel angry. I don't have to be angry though for the rest of the day. You know, how they get to work and be so mad holding on to something. So it's, it reminds me of that kind yes. of self talk is that yes. analysis of mm -hmm. is what I'm saying to myself useful or not. Exactly. Because your, your mm -hmm. brain 
your thoughts will either work for you and or work against you. There's no in between. Now, one of the um, I can't tell you the exact reference, but in Jeremiah, there is a wonderful verse that says, "The heart is deceitful above all things." Okay, so let me tell you about Hebrew. All right, in Hebrew, whenever you see the word heart, you can substitute the word mind. Okay, so in other words, sometimes we can't let our emotions and feelings guide us because guess what? Sometimes they can deceive us. All right, so scripture tells us that too. Okay, so thank you for that. Yes, mindfulness is a big uh, word in the whole counseling, coaching. I think they know we're all stressed at work. They're like, here's some mindfulness courses. Yes, they're well, <laughs> very, very good. good. Yes, they're very good. Yeah. They're very good. Okay. Um, spiral upward, all right, as opposed to spiraling downward. All right. I'm going to um, give you just a little bit of positivity research. Uh, Barbara Fredrickson, who's a researcher at Chapel Hill, wrote a book several years ago, great book called Positivity. Well, here again, she is just a numbers research kind of gal, all right? But I find it very interesting that science is showing what scripture has said all along. She has come through with her research with a ratio of greater than three to one. Okay, now what does that mean? That means, let's say, um, you had a very bad day at work. Let's just give that as an example. Oh, this was like one of the worst days at work like I've ever had, all right? So that's going to be the one. That's going to be your negative, the, the negative thing that's going on in your life right now. Well, if you focus only on that one thing that is, you know, whether it's a major stressor, let's say you've lost somebody, maybe, you know, Again, life and what happens is on a continuum too, right? It goes from having a bad day to really having a life-changing event occur. But the one is that negative in your life that's going on. The greater than three to one means you better find at least three things to be thankful for in a given day, especially when that one is going on in your life, okay? So when I am in a a season of high stress, I keep a gratitude journal. Now, I shouldn't do it all the time. I don't. But I especially do it when I am down and out. Because here's the, the, the wonderful thing about how God created our brains. If we tend to focus only on the thing that is really going horribly in our lives, we're going to spiral down. Okay? But when we start acknowledging intentionally recognizing the things that are going well even if it's things that we've never really paid attention to before you're actually balancing out your brain activity to where you can actually spiral up and feel like you have more options and have more peace and less worry um, then if you just focus on the one thing that can really suck you down in a hurry right and um, so that's one thing that positivity and research is showing us today. And I always put right, right, right. You know, journal, journal, journal. Mm -hmm. If you're in a, a bad way or having a bad day or, you know, you're in some chronic stress, you know, write those things out. It is very therapeutic. In fact, when I work at the hospital, if the patients wanted a journal, we would just provide it for them. Because, again, writing those things out that are on your mind are very therapeutic for you. Okay, now one thing that I will tell you about, um, Lauren did a great job in talking about the brain chemistry. When we, when we do not pay attention to our self-talk and do not challenge the lies that we tell ourselves, I say they fall into three categories. Either we're telling ourselves lies about ourselves, other people, or God. I think it pretty much covers it. <laughs> so we've got to be very careful. But what happens in the brain is you actually form what we call neural ruts. And the more you have unhealthy thinking, that rut gets ingrained, ingrained, ingrained. It's sort of like a tire going through the yard over and over and over and over again till it just wears a path down deep. There's no grass anymore. So 
you know, we've got to be very careful about what we think about um, because it literally changes the chemistry in our brain. Now, the great thing about how God has created us, it's a big word called neuroplasticity. If you learn to change the way you think, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, yeah. okay, you can actually change the brain chemistry, those neural ruts that have formed grooves. You can actually change the chemistry in your brain by changing the way you think. It's amazing. Okay, we're going to go on. So we've talked about the physical part. Um, and the mind part, now we're going to talk about the, the social aspect of life. Y'all, we are not meant to live on an island by ourselves. Okay, I don't care what you're going through. Now, it doesn't mean you need to broadcast it to the world and announce it in your Bible study class, because there's always going to be somebody in there who's doing this number, right? Um, but isn't that the, the way things are? You better have a trusted few to do life with, okay? Okay. Um, and, and support, your support network can, can be anybody, depending on the season of life that you're in. It can be a pastor, it can be a counselor, it can be a life coach, it can be a friend that you just meet with on a regular basis and have a cup of coffee. I've got a friend right now going through a really, really tough time. She's had four months, the last four months have been unlike any four months she has ever had in her life up to this point. And I'm touching base with her regularly. How are you? Do you want to meet for coffee? Yes. You know, so you know, be creative with who your support network is if you're in a season of stress. Because again, as long as you keep things up here, they don't get smaller, they get bigger, mm -hmm. right? So you've got to share it with a trusted, with trusted people. Okay, and God speaks, all right? So a big portion of my life, if I had my devotion in a day, it was to check it off the box and say, wow, God, thanks, five minutes. I've done a great job today. Okay. <laughs> but you know what? <clears throat> this is what um, soothes your soul when you're in a season of stress. It's to find a verse or just a handful of verses that speak to your soul like nothing else will. Okay, I always say that, that, you know, if I'm in a season of stress, I find a verse, I don't need to read a chapter. It's not about running through the Bible in a year when I'm in a season of stress. I find two or three verses that I put on a note card and I pull them up, I carry them with me, and I read them over and over and over again because I need beliefs in his promises that challenges what my life experience is. So remember, God speaks to the heart. He doesn't care less about you checking off your, your to-do list with um, a devotion, right? He's there for the Holy Spirit to penetrate your mind and to speak truth into your soul. Now, if you've lost someone, um, there's the new normal, okay? Um, I do facilitate grief share at Green Street. And one of the ladies on the video, we have great videos, but she said that when she lost her father, that following Christmas, you know, decorating the tree was their really big thing, or his big thing. Well, they just couldn't do it. They couldn't do the tree thing. It was just too painful. So what they decided to do as a family was just to get a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. All right. So, you know, there, there is a new normal when someone is now not there. Okay, and so re, you know, rethinking traditions is a very good thing, all right? So when the first Christmas that I had without my family, I thought, well, what now what? <laughs> so I don't have to drive to Lynchburg. Um, you know, what, what are the traditions that I now want for my family that I do have? So rethinking traditions is fine. Okay, shift responsibility, simplify. You know, again, um, our self-talk usually lands itself in those rules that we give ourselves for what we're supposed to do, how life is supposed to work, what Thanksgiving is supposed to look like, what Christmas is, needs to, to, to look like. And mm -hmm. if you're in a season of stress or if you've lost someone, shift the responsibilities. Simplify your life. You know, 
don't feel, you know, think creatively that you don't need to keep doing what you've done just for the sake of staying with tradition. You don't need to do that. Now, surprise by triggers. The musical notes are, are actually, I'm gonna give you two little examples. The first one is um, the first birthday that I had after my parents died. Um, I guess my friends thought I was having a midlife crisis. So they took me to South Point Mall in Durham and I got my ears double pierced. Well, oh. we got there early. And so they said, oh, let's go into Pottery Barn. So we went into Pottery Barn and y'all, I had not been in there 30 seconds when the song coming over the speaker was actually a song that my mom had dedicated to me right after I went home to live with him as a baby um, called More. It was a very famous song in the 60s. More than the greatest love the world has known. It's a beautiful song. Well, that song started playing on the intercom and I thought I am just going to lose, and I did, I lost it, um, in Pottery Barn at South Point Mall. I found a corner, turned around, and I just boo-hooed for at least two minutes. All right, so if, if someone is grieving this holiday season, or you're grieving, there are going to be triggers through the senses, all right, because senses are powerful, right? Laura's talked about how we want the senses to work for us. Sometimes they work against us, and they can be triggers that just make us fall apart. But... Music for me is one of my coping skills. All right, everybody needs a list of tools in their toolbox for when life hits and things get stressful because the tools are what buffer the stress in any season of time. Um, I call it, what's your top 10 list? Okay, so for me, uh, it would be music, reading, um, bubble baths, <laughs> Well, I so you've got to have your own top 10 list because these things, healthy behaviors, not unhealthy behaviors, healthy behaviors that help buffer the stress that you're going through. Okay, slow down versus busyness. You know, um, we get so caught up in busyness. <coughs> Y'all, I love America. I can't imagine being anywhere else. But if you've ever traveled abroad or especially in Europe, we do not have all the answers in this country. Mm. Okay, you go to a European country and you will have dinner for three hours. It's great. You know, there is not the busyness that over there that has just become so much part of our lifestyle, unfortunately, here in this country. Um, but we should not feel guilty for slowing down and taking away some of that busyness. Or even if you're busy, carve out the time be intentional about pampering yourself. That is not a selfish thing, okay? Now again, shun the to-do list. You know, if you're grieving, the rules go out the window for what needs to happen during the holiday season, all right? Um, and those rules are those things that you tell yourself that uh, those expectations that you have about what the holidays are supposed to look like. But whether it's the holidays, even if you're not grieving, if you're having a season of stress, prioritize what really needs to happen and let the rest go okay now I love visual things why because again we're talking about the senses tonight we know the power of aroma what how the effect that it has on the brain what about the power of sight okay this was actually uh, the floral arrangement that my boys gave to my mother-in-law for her birthday in October. And I thought, gosh, that's so pretty. I just want to take a picture of it. Okay. Put visual uh, reminders around you that make you smile. You know, what is it? What, you know, what do you like that when you see it, it just puts you in a good, happy place? Um, and again, here I list the top 10 lists for coping behaviors. You want positive things that put you in a healthy emotional place oh, okay let me go back Oops, one. if you're grieving don't be surprised if the people around you are silent okay I was so surprised that my closest girlfriends after I lost my parents never asked me how I was I thought that's the darndest thing I've ever heard <laughs> like how can my closest friends not even ask me how I'm doing well you know what it's a learning curve for them too, and they don't want you upset because other people are uncomfortable with tears. 
Okay, so what usually happens is that people stay silent. All right, so again, don't have an unrealistic expectation for them. Um, if you need to talk about your loved one, talk about your loved one. It doesn't mean you need to go on and on and on about it, but you initiate the, the speaking and the feelings with the people around you, but don't be surprised if others are silent. Um, okay, so I call this my mom tree. Um, I kept some of her big blingy earrings that looks like she probably bought them in the 80s or early 90s. I didn't want to throw them away, and I thought, well, what am I going to do with these? So I went to Hobby Lobby probably two or three Christmases ago and got this little Christmas tree, and I just hung her earrings on it. Oh, now, the yeah. interesting thing is I went this week, and I've added to this collection. I've got a grandma tree. I have not mentioned my grandmother, but um, she did a major part. She did all my child raising when we moved back to the States. That's another story for another time. But I have a grandmother tree, a dad tree, and a mom tree. And I've got them all on this marble top table at the top of our steps. So um, again, a visual reminder that makes you smile and also keeps the memory of your loved one alive which I think is, is pretty cool to have. Now, if you're hurting and stressed out, one of the best things you can do is to help somebody else. Now, um, if anybody has ever read Victor Frankl's book, has anyone ever read Man's Search for Meaning? I've heard of it. Oh, it's a wonderful book. Victor Frankl is a psych or was a psychiatrist, one of the founding fathers in counseling, actually. But he was uh, in two concentration camps, I believe, at least one, maybe two. And so um, it's, it's a fascinating book, but he continued to treat patients after, you know, he was released as a prisoner. And for his depressed patients who would come to him, it, you know, they would say, because uh, again, you've got to watch how you think because it'll either spiral you up or spiral you down. And so he noticed that many of them said, well, what is society going to do for me now? You know, I, I've been in a concentration camp, which is a horrific experience. I can't, like none of us will ever experience that, right? We can't relate to that. Uh, and I can't imagine the effects that that would have on somebody. But they would come to him and they're like, you know, now what? What does life have to offer to me at this point? And he would always turn the question back on them and say, you're asking the wrong question. The question is, what do you have to contribute to society? Okay, and so it is for us. You know, I always say God's plan covers the lifespan, and we are part of a bigger plan to encourage and help other people. Um, because it's very easy when, when life is not going well to focus on ourselves. All right, well, I get that. You know, I know when I kind of, you know, hover in, I, I can think back to some times where I've had like two or three weeks where I just didn't want to go out. I didn't want to see anybody. I just felt sorry for myself. I didn't kind of want to face the world. But one of the best things you can do is to say, well, what, how can I help somebody even though I'm feeling like this? You act even though you don't feel. Again, you got to watch those emotions because action you know, it actually can change your cognitive process when you act beyond the way you feel, okay? Oh, oh I pressed the wrong thing. There we go. And the, I wanted to end with just the season's purpose. Y'all, I don't know if any of you have done a, a study on um, the names of God or, you know, just the different names that we hear, but... Emmanuel means what? God with us. us. God with us. Okay, and when people are hurting, sometimes we feel like God is far, far away, don't we? Which is incorrect. Okay, so we've got to change our belief system for who God is in our lives. But understand the reason Jesus came was so he could identify with every life experience we will ever face on this side of heaven. Okay? God with you. He's not distant. He's not far away. He came as a baby, Emmanuel, to penetrate 
the presence of your life because he wanted to identify with every emotion and every life event that comes your way. And that is the purpose for why he came. Okay, do y'all have any questions? Yeah, we don't. Wonderful. Oh, oh, so wonderful. oh thank you. <laughs> oh, I have a question. Sure. So I lost my brother at Christmas and I've been trying to make a change. Okay. And my mom is fighting me on the change. So how do you make a change and create new traditions when his mother doesn't want to do that? <laughs> okay. All right. Great point. Um, Y'all can tell I like to read a lot. Stephen <laughs> Covey's book, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful, Successful effective, effective, effective People. All right. One of the chapters in there, he talks about the circle of concern and the circle of influence. Yes. Okay. Now, the circle of concern are those things that concern us but that we don't have any control over the circle of influence are those things that we have direct control over you cannot change your mother or what she wants or not to do you can't do any you can only do things that you have direct control over you know i've been married for 32 it'll be 33 years in december i can't change my husband i mean i can't I can. Now I can suggest things, <laughs> you know, but I ultimately can't make him do something that he only he can do for himself. So my answer for you is I would find common denominators. So if there's something that you and your mom can agree on in the holiday season, okay, but if you want to do something different, that is something that you have control over and you don't need to necessarily wait on her. But you don't want to be disrespectful either. Right. Okay. So for me, um, again, I started new traditions after I lost my family. But I had to kind of make sure that my husband and his parents were on board too, that it didn't like interfere with what they wanted to happen as well. So it's sort of a both and, not an either or. Does that make sense? So if you want to do something just yourself to keep the memory of your brother alive i say go for it you know if you want to get a little tabletop tree and yeah, i like your tree idea. i don't know if he had like a certain <laughs> hobby or if he had a certain career you know what you can do something that that allows his legacy to stay alive and you can remember him in a special way and remember him in a special way that that you have done for yourself so your mom and you don't necessarily need to agree on all of it but if you want to do something special, then <laughs> do something that's within your control to do. Okay. I, I hope that's helpful. It's helpful. You, you just can't change what someone else does and doesn't do. No. You just can't do that. But once you realize that that's not within your ability to control, it's actually a little freeing. <laughs> you know? Right. When you realize you can't make someone do something, it's, it's actually a little bit freeing. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Y'all have any other questions?